Welcome to the first program in our webinar series, NASA Aeronautics, Aviation at the Leading Edge. I'm Scott Terry, Director of the Aviation Institute at the University of Nebraska at Omaha and Director of the Nebraska Space Grant Consortium. NASA's Space Grant Program has consortia of universities and other partners in each state, plus Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia, which are focused on STEM education, workforce development, and research inspired by the exciting work of NASA's mission directorates. I want to thank Old Dominion University for hosting this webinar series and their fantastic facilities. Yes, we're called Space Grant, but we have members across the nation who work on aeronautics, aviation-related challenges. So for this series, we're going to focus on the first A in NASA, aeronautics, the study of science of flight. NASA has made decades of contributions to aviation safe and sustainable by reducing emissions, noise, and fuel consumption while enhancing safety in the national airspace. NASA developed technologies on board literally every commercial aircraft and at every commercial airport in the U.S. So we've partnered mm -hmm. with NASA's Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate to introduce you to the people, the ideas, and the technology driving the ongoing transformation of aviation. We start tonight with the challenge of quiet supersonic flight over land. We'll be answering questions after our main presentation. To submit a question, use the chat feature in the web page at any time during the broadcast. Please include your first name, your major, and your university so we can recognize you. I'd like to welcome Mary Stringer, aerospace researcher, and Corey Diebler, X-59 flight dynamics and simulation lead from NASA's Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. Thank you. So, if Corey and Mary, could you tell us where you're originally from and where you attended university? Sure. I grew up in New Jersey. I did my undergraduate degree at the United States Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. And then I did all of my graduate work at the University of Florida in, in Gainesville, Florida. I was born and raised in a small town, Bucyrus, Ohio, uh, and uh, studied aerospace engineering at The Ohio State University, OH. Very good. We're not falling for that. <laughs> when I first heard we were discussing supersonic flight, I immediately thought about the previous efforts, the Concorde, which most people are familiar with, the Soviet Tu-144, and the American SST program in the 1960s. Can you remind us what happened with those programs? Sure. While they were pretty advanced for their time, um, they were also plagued with quite a few issues. Um, to start with, the American SST program never actually was built, um, so that one never got off the ground. As for the Concorde and the Soviet Tu-144, they had quite a few issues. The first is that they were noisy, they were loud. Uh, they legally weren't able to fly over land, so their routing was subsonic over land um, and could be supersonic only over water. So their routes were limited in, in their usefulness. Uh, the second issue was, uh, was maintenance. Unfortunately, they had quite a few um, pretty tragic mishaps and uh, just constantly plagued with maintenance issues. The last was fuel efficiency, and this is a big one. Uh, back then, the, the engine technology isn't, isn't what it is today. Um, it's, it's actually come qu quite a long way, but because it was not fuel efficient, it made it very expensive to operate which ultimately meant that the passengers who were using this for commercial service were more or less unwilling to pay these lofty fees just to fly commercially supersonic and get there faster. So uh, Concorde's last flight was, was in 2003, and, and so for, for like the last two decades, it, it pretty much has not been a big player in, in our aerospace industry, right? Very good. So that was then. This is now. We want to know why NASA is exploring supersonic flight today and what's changed. Mary and Corey are here tonight to tell us about this in some detail, but we'd like to show a video first that shows the key components of NASA's quest to quiet the boom.
That's certainly impressive. I, I guess it begs the question, Corey, why is NASA exploring supersonic flight now? Well, the truth is that uh, we've never really stopped exploring supersonic flight, but I guess the difference being now we, we believe that we have the, the design tools and methodologies necessarily, necessary to, to bring down the, the sonic boom to lower levels. You know, Mary had just mentioned that, uh, that the Concorde was only able to fly uh, supersonically over the ocean. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and that was primarily due to the sonic boom that it created when it was flying. It's, uh, for those of you who have not heard sonic booms, uh, it is like a cannon going off. I mean, they can be very startling. They, uh, they rattle ceiling tiles, they set off car alarms, and, and when you're not expecting them, they'll make you jump. And so that's, that was the, the prohibition, I guess, against the Concorde flying supersonic. And like I said, now we have the tools and the design methods to, to bring that down to where we think that, that we can get a, a, a necessary rule change to do that. So can you tell us more specifically what the X-59 mission is and how that fits in with NASA's plans? Sure. So the X-59 is, uh, is going to be NASA's first manned experimental airplane built from scratch uh, in, uh, gosh, several decades now. Um, and the goal of the mission is going to be to, to, to fly it, uh, demonstrate that we do have the technology necessary to, to lower the boom, and collect the data to, to provide to the regulation agencies, the FAA, the International Civil Aviation Organization that, uh, that we, can, we can actually achieve this goal of ours of reopening the supersonic commercial industry uh, for, for passengers like you and me and for, uh, for U.S. Uh, manufacturers to, to lead the market. Excellent. I guess uh, another question that I have, and I'm sure others have, is what, what exactly is the sonic boom? Can you, that, can you explain that to us? Sure. So it is a popular misconception that sonic booms, you only hear a sonic boom uh, when an airplane initially breaks the sound barrier, but <laughs> that's not true. Uh, a son any airplane or any object moving through the atmosphere faster than the speed of sound will create shock waves. So the picture that you see on the screen right now is, uh, is an actual image, uh, it's something that they've been working on out at uh, NASA Armstrong to take pictures of the shock waves uh, of these airplanes as they fly. So this is a T-38 flying supersonically, and you can see all the shock waves that are coming off of that. Uh, they're coming off of the nose, the tail, the wing, the, the cockpit, canopy. Um, any, any little bump on the, on the vehicle will create these shock waves. And so what happens with these shock waves, as they travel down towards the ground, uh, they start to pile up one on top of, a, of another. And uh, that just kind of uh, amplifies their strength. So. Uh, for example, the, uh, on this slide here, the, it's a Concorde-like design up top that, that's creating these shock waves. And, and you can see as they come down, they pile up on top of each other, and so you end up with, with two shock waves, one on the front end and one on the back. And they call it an, an N wave because that, uh, that signature on the ground kind of looks like an N. But it's that very sharp rise on the front and the back that creates this, uh, this booming noise as it passes over our eardrums. And uh, so that's what we're trying to, to alleviate. So with our design methodologies that we have now, um, we're able to keep those shock waves from coalescing and, and piling up on top of each other. And so when that happens, they, uh, the individual shocks weaken as they go down towards the ground. And since they don't pile up, they don't uh, create such a sharp rise. And so you end up with a, a, a more gentle thump or something that I've heard uh, people describe it as uh, uh, a door slamming in the distance or, or rolling thunder, something along those lines. Great, so I think we want to start digging into the, some of the technical details. And maybe to start that, could you tell us more about how the X-59 design is going to con help control the shape of that sonic boom? Sure. So we've done a number of things on, uh, on X-59 to to manage the, the shape of the boom and the magnitude. One of the things you'll see on, on these pictures is uh, this vehicle has a very long nose, and that's, that pushes that initial front shock further out in the front, which uh, helps it uh, that, that the other shocks don't uh, pile up on that. It also has uh, canards, which are the, the smaller wing-like uh, um, wings uh, just in front of the cockpit. And those are there to, to help the vehicle trim at the right uh, 
at the right angle of attack, the right deflections at the cruise condition, because those affect the boom as well. Um, this vehicle has both an all-moving stabilator on the back end, as well as a T-tail, which looks like a, a small, uh, small uh, horizontal tail up high. And that T-tail is, is another feature that allows us to tailor the, the sonic boom coming off the aft end. Um, it also has an engine that's mounted high and up above the wing. So that way, any shocks that come off of that engine inlet are reflected by the wing and go upward rather than down towards the ground. And then though you can't see it in this picture, on the underside of the vehicle, there are a couple of, of boom bumps that are kind of variables. And we, we're going to have the ability to change those to different shapes as well that, that can help us further tailor that uh, sonic boom coming off of, from underneath. That's great. So reducing the, the noise or the, the sonic boom, how, how quiet is quiet enough? Or how quiet does this aircraft need to become? That's a good question. So the Concorde uh, created a sonic boom on the order of 109 PLDB, and that's a, a perceived loudness decibels. Uh, most fighter aircraft these days are on the order of 100 PLDB. Um, on the chart that's, that's showing right now, you can see that there's a threshold for discomfort up around 200, loud music around 100, traffic around 80. And so the goal that we're shooting for with our aircraft is uh, 75 PLDB. And that's based on some, uh, some historical studies that NASA has done that we believe that if we can achieve 75 PLDB, that that's where uh, what will be acceptable to the public, that we'll be able to present that data to the FAA, to, to the regulation agencies to get the rule changed. Great. So Mary, I, I understand the X-59 is what's called a technology demonstration uh, it's, it, as distinct from a prototype. Can you tell us a little bit about what that means and what are the implications for the program? Yeah, sure. Um, the important thing to remember here is that what we are building is a demonstrator. Um, it's not scalable. It's not something the public will ever fly in. Um, it's not a prototype at all. Uh, so that will be left up to the industry members to, to develop their own aircraft. Will the tools that we're developing today help them create their prototypes? Yes, definitely. Uh, that's one of our big missions is, is to be developing the technical tools to design aircraft that are low boom. Um, so that will, those will be used by industry, but this particular aircraft is to uh, is used only to create essentially that, that database um, to turn over to the FAA and, and ICAO to kind of redefine what the regulation should be. So uh, it's a demonstrator, not, not a prototype. So. Great, that's really, it's really interesting. I think uh, one of the things or a number of things that maybe you can help us understand are that there's got to be some unique challenges with this uh, type of aircraft, the X-59. Can you talk to a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. Um, of course there are. Uh, essentially, our mission is one thing, is to lower the sonic boom signature. So we optimized over that. So the, the outer mold line of the aircraft, which is essentially the physical shape of, of the aircraft, as, as Corey did a great job of, of explaining, you know, we optimized over that, but unfortunately there, there were some less than ideal uh, things that fell out. And, and two of those were um, the, forward, the forward vision on the aircraft as well as the stability of the airplane. So as you can kind of see in the, in the first picture, the cockpit, um, you know, the glass is over the pilot's head. So yeah, there is a cockpit and he can see out it, but his forward vision it is, is very, very limited. Uh, so to deal with that, uh, NASA has developed something called the external vision system. You'll see it in literature written as XVS, but it's a, a series of sensors and displays and, and image processing uh, technologies uh, all con combined to create this pseudo out the, out the cockpit front view so that the pilot can safely maneuver in the national airspace as well as land safely. So this is not a safety critical system, but it is definitely a very useful tool for the pilots to, to continue to fly safely in this, in this aircraft that has such limited forward vision. The other thing that I mentioned was the stability of the aircraft. So the shape itself um, is optimal for the boom, but it's not optimal for, for stability and control. Um, and that's a pretty important thing because that points directly to safety. Um, so because it is unstable, uh, aircraft in the past were, were more or less stable and naturally. 
Um, and you were able to use mechanical controls to, to deal with that. But today, we, we have to use more complex fly-by-wire digital controls to control this airplane. And that essentially means that those mechanical controls where the pilot puts the input into the stick and it gets transferred to the control surfaces, um, being modified only by mechanical means is, is no longer going to control an airplane like this. So you need a computer in the system, and that's what fly-by-wire means. Uh, that computer contains algorithms which take that input, what the, the pilot's commands are, and then they modify it so that the output of that airplane is stable and it moves the control surfaces as such. So those, those flight controls, it's very important, as you can see, that they are essentially tuned and, and very robust. And the best way we can do that today is by designing or making sure that our plant model is as accurate as we can possibly get it. Uh, one, of the, one of the difficult things here is that we've never designed an airplane like this. Usually when you go to to create an aero database of coefficients of forces and moments, you're able to look at a lot of historic aircraft and say, okay, even though we've done some testing, we, have, we feel pretty good about it because it matches uh, past data. Well, we don't have that capability. So, so NASA and Lockheed Martin together have extensively tested these, the, this airfoil, these, this aircraft, in the wind tunnels and using CFD, which is computational fluid dynamics. Um, and we feel that we've created this, this database that is, is going to be pretty close to what the actual, we'll find that the actual air, aircraft will perform at um, in terms of uh, coefficients of forces and moments. So, so that way we're able to uh, feel pretty secure when we design these control laws around the uh, dynamics of the airplane um, that, the, that this will ultimately be a safe and stable aircraft for the pilots in it. Uh, the other thing that is important to mention is that the sonic boom levels are very sensitive to a lot of the flight parameters, um, such as angle of attack, the control surface positions, the altitude, Mach, things like that. So having a very robust um, flight control system, including autopilots, it turns out to be really necessary to do this kind of flight testing that we're, going, we're planning to do with the aircraft. That's great. Uh, Corey, I guess the next question is um, where clearly work's being done to overcome these challenges uh, to deal with the, the sonic boom. When, when is this airplane going to fly and what's the, what's the plan for, for testing it? Sure. So we've uh, broken our mission up into uh, three distinct phases. Uh, phase one is our aircraft development phase. And so we actually just completed our project CDR out in Palmdale uh, earlier, well, I guess last month, mid-September. And, uh, and so now we're, we're moving on forward, completing that design and, and fabrication of the airplane. Actual airplane has begun out in Palmdale, California at, the, at our Lockheed facility out there. Um, so, th so that'll continue. The airplane will be uh, put together in, in our initial flight. We're targeting 2021. And that'll be our, uh, our checkout flight where we essentially go out to, to make sure that the, the aircraft is safe to fly, that it uh, handles the way that we predict that it will be. Uh, we expand the envelope, uh, checking for, for loads, flutter, uh, again, kind of safety, making sure that we can operate to the speeds and to the uh, altitudes that we want to. So when that is done, we anticipate phase one might take about nine months to complete uh, that phase. We'll move into phase two, and that phase two will also be flown out at uh, Edwards, California, out at uh, NASA Armstrong there. And that, for, during that phase, we'll focus on uh, the sonic boom measurements, really kind of characterizing um, what kind of sonic boom levels we are seeing, not only on the ground, but also in flight. We'll have uh, uh, additional airplanes up there with uh, sensors on it that, that can take the, uh, uh, measure the sonic boom at different levels, different distances from the aircraft itself. And we'll uh, continue to to learn more about how the airplane flies and how we want to fly it for our phase three. So then uh, in phase three, which we anticipate will be in 2023, uh, that's when we'll do our community response uh, flights. And for that, that'll be a fun one because uh, we'll, we'll take the airplane out uh, throughout the country and uh, fly it over select communities. And the goal there is to collect this data, create this database that then we can deliver to the regulation agencies to get to get the, the rules changed. 
But uh, essentially what we'll do is, is we'll fly it um, supersonic and, and lay down sonic booms over the, the towns, the communities, the cities that we've selected. And uh, we'll, we'll take survey, survey the people, see how uh, objectionable they thought those sonic boom levels were and, and whether or not... There, there's actually a good chance that, that they won't even hear it. Um, as people go about their daily, daily lives and walking around through the cities and, and there's uh, traffic going up and down the streets, uh, there's a good chance that they won't even notice that there was a sonic boom. But if they do, like I said, it'll be more along the lines of, of thunder or or something that, that doesn't startle them and doesn't set off their car alarms. So I guess I've got a couple additional questions and I think we have time for that. So um, you mentioned Lockheed Martin. Uh, clearly there's some industry partners here and maybe you could talk a little bit about how NASA interacts with industry partners, uh, both from your positions as researchers, but also how uh, those industry partners play a role in, in what you're doing. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, with regards to Lockheed Martin, uh, it's obviously a, a clear contract with them, and they are doing a lot of the design work, and it, it's kind of a shared effort, and they're ultimately building it. Um, we're also analyzing everything they do, but a lot of the tools that we're using to do the development, wasn't they weren't just developed specifically by Lockheed Martin. It's, it's work that NASA has done with Boeing um, through extensions of HSCT, the High Speed Civil Transport, and and all of that uh, to essentially learn how to shape the airplane and the optimizations for that. Uh, Gulfstream's been a big participant in the propagation models, so how those, those sonic waves um, tra you know, translate down to the ground and building models that kind of essentially properly show what, you know, the difference between the near field, you know, what the signature is right around the aircraft as it propagates down and then what you hear on the ground. So Gulfstream's been a big participant um, in that as well, so, 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 anything to add? so we, we've got, somebody's going to have to fly this airplane, right? And so I know NASA has test pilots and there are other test pilots in the in industry. Is the test pilot need to be uh, prepared differently to fly this, this kind of aircraft? Uh, not too much. Uh, so we have three pilots right now uh, that, that will be flying this. Uh, one is a Lockheed Martin uh, test pilot, and he'll be the, the first to fly it. This is the Lockheed under contract for the Phase 1 and in, in envelope expansion flights. But then we have two pilots uh, out at NASA Armstrong that will be flying it as well. And each of them has flown supersonic airplanes before. Uh, not quiet ones, but... Uh, but I think on a routine basis uh, are going faster than the speed of sound. Um, Mary and I both work in the, the controls and handling qualities, flight dynamics uh, area of the airplane, and so we've, we've uh, attempted, done our best to make sure that, uh, that this airplane is, is pretty easy to fly and handles pretty well. So, so this, this, there shouldn't be anything too out of the ordinary, actually, when it comes to flying this. So I've got one, one more question for our, our technical session, and that is that this aircraft is really the, the, like you say, the demonstrator that hopefully gets us to a commercial supersonic transport, uh, which I would think would be a lot larger. Is, are, there, are there implications for how you scale this up to a larger plane that can carry people and, and carry cargo? Uh, so one of the things they have made sure is that is that there is traceability. So even though it is a demonstrator, not a prototype, as we, we talked about earlier, there has been a requirement to show that the sonic boob signature from a smaller aircraft is traceable. So that it is something that they are very conscious of and have been making sure that it's it's been maintained as a requirement. So, so yes, we do expect probably the initial wave to be smaller aircraft that hit the market uh, first. Um, but with the commercial aircraft, uh, the much larger ones that you're talking about, right behind them. So, so yes, traceability of that that sonic boom signature is has been a requirement, and it's been something that they've made sure is is going to work. But but it is a challenge that yeah, scalability <laughs> scaling up yeah. is a challenge. Mm -hmm. So this airplane is is uh, about 100 feet long. We're just shy of 100 feet long, um, and I think 30 feet wide. Uh, and so, yeah, when you when you scale it up, and that's that's just for the one pilot in this demonstrator. Uh, as you scale it up, uh, there are additional challenges, uh, structures being one, and, and flexibility that that uh, that makes it uh, a bigger challenge. So, like Mary said, it, it, it will start off with with kind of smaller aircraft, and as as we learn more, as the the companies learn more, then then it'll grow to to where we can put a couple hundred of us on there. Yeah. 
Very good. So we're going to shift gears in just a moment, but before we do, I want to give you another reminder to submit your questions using the chat feature in your web page. Again, please include your first name, your major, and the university that you, you attend. Really want to uh, take it, uh, advantage of Corey and Mary being here to help us understand how they got to where they are. So could you tell us a little bit more about your career journey? Sure. After I graduated from the Naval Academy, I took my commission in the Navy as a Naval officer in the aviation community and served proudly. Uh, after I got out, I went to graduate school. I started working on my PhD at University of Florida, as I had said. Um, worked on that for quite a while, and when I was all but dissertation, the opportunity at NASA was, I, I heard about it, and I applied for the position and fortunately got it. I was a little nervous about leaving when I was all but dissertation to work on my dissertation part-time and work full-time at NASA, um, and it certainly has been a huge challenge, um, but it's, it's manageable, it's doable, and, and uh, I've been fortunate enough to work on commercial supersonics since I came on board at NASA Langley. Um, as of late, I have kind of started looking at a little bit of uh, some internal research, uh, putting together a proposal um, for some uncertainty analysis related to uh, CFD and wind tunnel testing and propagating those that dispersion model for, for the, the aero database, essentially. I want, I want to look at some, some essentially, math uh, applications there. And so, so that's kind of something that I'm looking at in the near future as well. Great. Nick, Corey, you've had a slightly different path. Yeah. So when I was at, uh, at Ohio State, I, I learned of uh, the opportunity for an internship at NASA Glenn. And so I did that. Uh, I think it was in between my junior and senior year at Ohio State. Um, and that really kind of opened the door for me in, in terms of working for NASA. And then when I graduated, I, uh, I hired on with NASA full time out at NASA Armstrong and in Edwards, California. And so I worked out there and got to work on some flight projects on the aero, on the aero side of NASA. And then from there, I, I bounced around a little bit. I, uh, I moved to Florida and worked at NASA's Kennedy Space Center on the, on the shuttle program down there. And then I came up to NASA Langley, where I worked on another rocket program. Uh, we did a test launch of the Ares 1X rocket while I was at NASA Langley. I did a, a detail, a, a nine-month detail at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., and then when I came back uh, from that, I started working uh, supersonics and, and got involved in uh, X-59. So, Corey, you did an, a NASA internship, is that correct? Can I you, did. Can you yeah. elaborate on that a little bit more? At Space Grant, we're big fans of uh, internships at NASA, so maybe you can share some of your experience with yeah, us. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh it was it was a great experience. Um, I, I was working was the tailplane icing program there at NASA Glenn. They have a, a wind tunnel where they can uh, blow water in and at freezing temperatures and build up ice formations on on wings and tails and helicopters and all kinds of stuff. And so I was working in there, but uh, but more than anything, it was it was a great like I said, kind of opened the door for me. Um, you know, made, made some connections, got to know people, got to know what NASA was all about and how things worked there, which really was an advantage for me for, for when, when I graduated and, and looked to, to hire on full time with NASA or anywhere really. So, so yeah, I highly recommend uh, the internship programs as something to definitely go for. So, and I know Mary uh, didn't do an internship, but she's been a mentor to uh, interns. And I think maybe from that perspective, what, how do you see internships playing a, a role in the personal professional development of, uh, of young people? Yeah, definitely. This, this last summer, um, Corey and I actually shared three interns to work on a uh, X-59 related project. Um, and they actually came from all different backgrounds. Uh, one was computer science, two of them were aer aerospace engineering, but, but their interests were very different. And I, I feel like we were able to, um, well, or I should say they were able to uh, have access to, you know, people like myself who are, are more recent hires and people who have been there for years and to kind of learn how the process is, like w learn what happens within the walls at NASA and, and, you know, have a fairly relaxed mentorship relationship with, you know, researchers who are, are you know, doing cutting edge work. So I think... Um, I think our in, our interns enjoyed their time this summer, and I hope they, they would agree. But uh, yeah, I mean, the amount of contacts they made and, and what they actually got to see. I mean, Corey and I were, were pretty proactive about just taking them to everything we possibly could and, and getting them in to see all sorts of things. So, you know, it's I think it was very eye-opening for them, and like I said, they made quite a few contacts. Great. 
So it, it's pretty clear from um, hearing what Corey and Mary work on and the project they're involved in that they really love what they're doing. And, and maybe you could talk a little more specifically about, you've touched on some of this already, but what really inspires or motivates you? What do you really love about working at NASA? For me, it's, it's, I think, when left to my own devices, I'm a pretty theoretical person. Math is what kind of drives how my brain works. Um, but, but, you know, too much of one thing is a bad thing. So NASA's great. You know, there's, I work on this very applied research project, but at the same time, I'm allowed to kind of pursue the more theoretical things that I'm interested in. And that's not always true out in certain um, sectors of industry, if you will. Uh, at NASA, you're, you're, you know, not only allowed, but, you know, supported when it comes to, to kind of allowing yourself to look into different aspects of, of being an engineer and a researcher. So I, I love that about where I work. Corey? Yeah, I'd kind of more or less second what Mary said. You know, the, the, I'd say the, the best thing is, is just all the different projects that I've got to work on in my career. I've been very fortunate. I've, I've worked on a number of flight projects, been in the control room for um, uh, flight project when I was out at uh, uh, NASA Armstrong as a modified F-18. It's in the control room for shuttle launches at Kennedy Space Center and, and uh, the, the rocket that I worked on that I mentioned before and, and now X-59. So just, just all the, the varied projects and, and all of them, just super interesting that, uh, that it's hard to get bored, I guess. Right. That's true. Yeah. Great. So I know we've got a variety of, of students from around the nation, if not around the world, watching tonight. And so we've got some engineers, technologists, uh, designers, project managers, computer programmers, and, and so on. If you uh, could help us or maybe help them, what you wish you knew then that you know now? In other words, what kind of advice can you give some, some young people out there who are aspiring to, to move into roles like the ones that you have now? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think my biggest piece of advice and something I, I learned from experience is that don't put yourself in a box. Um, I'm an electrical engineer, and I know when I was starting graduate work, I, wasn't, I knew I, I wanted to work in aerospace, um, so I was you know, torn as to whether that meant that my graduate work should be in, the air, in aero or, or if I should continue as an electrical engineer. And I didn't really have anyone kind of telling me one way or another. And, so I was, I was constantly concerned that I wasn't going to be able to get the position that I wanted at that moment um, if I stayed as an electrical engineer. And, and I guess my advice is, is don't put yourself in a box. Like, follow, follow what you are interested in. Make sure that your education is broad and that you're good at it. And then ultimately, you'll have a lot of options down the road as your, as your ideas change about what kind of application of engineering you, what you're interested in. I know that's true for controls. Um, you know, as long as you understand the mathematical theory behind controls, you can work in a lot of different application areas. And, uh, you know, if you're like me, you, you weren't blessed at knowing exactly what you wanted to do at, at, at age 18 or even 22 for that matter. So if, if, you, if you don't put yourself in that box, if you don't create a formula for what you think needs to exactly happen to get your dream job, I think you'll be better off. At, you know, at, like I said, just don't, don't create this notion of what you think you have to do. Just follow what you're interested in and, and ultimately I think you'll you'll find you have a lot of opportunity. So. Great. Corey? Yeah, again, I think I'd, I'd echo mostly what, what Mary had said. Um, you know, I think the, some of the most fun that, I, that I've had in my career are, are the times where I wasn't really sure how it was going to go. You know, taking, taking that step, uh, you know, maybe a little bit further, getting outside of your comfort area a little bit. Um, you know, when, when I moved to California, I, I came from a small town in Ohio, and, and uh, you know, moving to California was, was a big deal for me at the time. Um, I think I, ha I the, the moving truck showed up, and, and I had a TV and a mattress, and that's what I went to California with, you know, not really sure what I was getting into. But it was a great experience. It was a great experience. I learned a lot from that. Every move that I made, um, you know, across the country, coming from, from NASA Armstrong to uh, Kennedy Space Center, you know, just even though it was it was still within NASA, uh, such a different experience, and, and it those kind of things help you see the bigger picture and, and really broaden your perspective on things. And so, my opinion is it's been really good to to change things up like that. And, and again, that's one of the things that, that working at NASA has really allowed me to do. And, and so I'd say you know don't be afraid to do that. Even like Mary said, even even if it's things that 
that you're not quite sure that you're qualified for. You know, I've known a lot of people who, who've applied for jobs, who have jobs, who say, tell me that, that I'm not qualified. I don't meet all the requirements that are on the job description, but none of us do. Yeah. <laughs> so, sure. so go for it. And, and, uh, and yeah, you learn a lot that way. Great. So I think learn broadly and take some chances yeah. and, yeah, and your, your career can take you some amazing places. So we've got a lot of questions to, from the audience, uh, which I appreciate very much. Uh, if there was a prize for the first question, it would go to Braden Rickert, uh, majoring in aerospace engineering at University of Alabama. Unfortunately, Braden, there's no prize for the first question, but that's a great question. If you were a pilot of an aircraft that surpasses the speed of sound, will you also hear the sonic boom? Uh, no, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. Uh, so, you know, the, the sonic booms are all going on all around you, um, but since you're sitting there, none of those pressure waves are going across your ear. So, you know, I've, I've, Talk to some of these pilots before, and, and they say that you know, unless unless if I didn't have that little meter, that little gauge in the cockpit that told me I was going supersonic, uh, that they wouldn't know it. So no, I unless there's a difference in engine noise, um, you would not, you wouldn't notice it, and, and you definitely wouldn't hear the sonic boom. Yeah, you'd also be on your ears. Right, so you'd be you on your ears. ears. <laughs> so <laughs> it's so loud that you you wouldn't you wouldn't want right. to be hearing even if you didn't hear the boom. You, you wouldn't want. So another question, actually also from University of Alabama, uh, from Andrew, majoring in aerospace engineering. Which major structural component required the most design changes from those found in conventional aircraft? Uh, I don't know that I can pinpoint one since neither of us were uh, designers of the outer mold line. But I can tell you that a lot of the recent changes uh, to the outer mold line that we discussed earlier has been the placement of, of, the, of the engine, essentially, and the inlet. Um, because there, I think there, it required a lot of optimization in that area. The nose was an easy change. They knew kind of what they needed to do there. And the same with the back end, the tail, the aft deck. It was, I think they kind of saw what the solution was, and it just took some optimization. Whereas with the placement of the engine and then the shaping of that, that nozzle, or the inlet and the nozzle, I think I think that you know probably gave them the most pause and has made them like readjust it multiple times recently. Maybe you can add to that. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a shot at this because <laughs> I think that some of our structural friends will <laughs> get on our case if we don't. But um, I, I, looking at, at some of the pictures that we have here, I don't know if we have a good picture that that shows it. But uh, on the 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 nozzle coming out of the the engine, there's mm -hmm. a um, kind of I guess a, an aft deck that uh, that helps to shield and some of that that noise coming off the aft end there from the engine and uh, block those sonic booms. But because that is there in, in its location, there's some some uh, it makes it tricky from a thermal standpoint because it's the, all the the hot gases coming out of the engine right there. And so I think that has been a challenge. So we'll we'll check with uh, our yeah, structures sure. group when we get back. But I'm going to go with the uh, the aft deck being the, the biggest challenge. Okay, so we've got a question from Isaiah who's majoring in aerospace engineering at University of Michigan, go blue. Uh, have you made any discoveries or advancements with Quest uh, that have applications in subsonic flight? If so, have you worked with any companies other than Lockheed to develop these further? Uh, honestly, the mission is not related to subsonic, so I'm yeah, the, that's you know, not what this this technology developers is for. The the XVS mm -hmm. probably has multiple applications that could yeah. be used beyond the supersonics, um, and so you know I, I, there's that. I don't know that we've that we've worked. You know, um, aside from that, I'm, I'm not sure that we've worked with any other uh, uh, industry partners on on any of the designs for, from Quest in the subsonic world. So you have to remember that. For this aircraft, the boom signature is is the number one mission. So if we don't get that right, then you're you're not going to be able to change the regulations, right? You won't you won't end up with yeah. a database, which means that you don't want to add any additional risk to this project by essentially other transformative uh, technologies kind of being piled on. So in, in a situation like this, where you already uh, you know have considerable risk, like are we going to get the PLDB right? You tend to not want to make 
the controls, a, you know, a research project or some structural, you know, you, you tend to want to focus and make sure that you get the one thing that, that will matter in the long run on this particular aircraft, right? So I think that's kind of what drives why we're not doing a lot of, you know, interesting subsonic related projects. Right. So Isaiah, I think what they're saying is if you're not going fast, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm not sure, that's what I got from that. So Jesse, uh, chemical engineering from uh, Texas A&M University asked, what is the PLDB of a common twin jet airliner such as uh, the Boeing 737? Hmm. That's that a sounds good like question. a quiz question that more is than a, quiz a question. technical. I'm not sure I can answer. You know, the, the, the PLDB um, is, a, is a measure, you know, it, it kind of differs from a regular decibel measure in that it's, uh, it's geared more towards short duration sound. So like a sonic boom, something that's a, uh, a, very, a very sudden impulse sound is, a, is the PLDB scale. Um, it, that's a, it's a very good question. I don't know if, if uh, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm okay, not sure. that's fair enough, I think. Uh, uh, this is a little different question, but I think it's one that's probably on a, on a number of people's minds. Uh, Ryan, who's in planetary science from Hampton University, uh, asked, there's a lot of public interest in dealing with the climate crisis, and air travel is often seen as wasteful when there are other means of transportation and telepresence. What kind of fuel efficiency might be expected with supersonic aircraft? Well, this, this particular aircraft, again, it's not a prototype, so obviously while we didn't want to be wasteful, uh, that wasn't the main thing we optimized over. But there are other projects at NASA that are focusing on making sure that, that future supersonic aircraft will have uh, more fuel efficient capabilities. And just like I said, we're, we're very aware of what caused the downfall of um, the 1960s efforts, and, and the big one was fuel efficiency, um, uh, also, you know, and its impact to right. you know, cost and climate and the environment. So uh, while we're not the ones working on that, be, be assured that there, is, there, are, there are projects right now that are, are very focused on that. So. Great, great. Uh, Cooper, an aerospace engineering student, University of Alabama asks, at what altitude will the X-59 cruise at what altitude will it create the boom? I guess he's trying to get three questions in for one. <laughs> what is the optimal altitude for deafening uh, the sonic boom? So that's, there's a good question. So um, X-59, uh, our design cruise condition is uh, Mach 1.4 at 55,000 feet. Um, and that is, that is a very, the airplane itself is kind of tailored for that condition or the condition for this airplane. They, they kind of go hand in hand. Um, and, and as you vary from that, then it, 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 it seems to be almost any direction you go makes the boom louder. Very few of them make them quieter. Um, you, as you do go up, you know, and, and the shock waves have further to travel to get to the ground, they, they do have more time to weaken, I guess. Atm atmospheric conditions also uh, play a part in that. Um, so it really depends on the airplane design as far as uh, the, the optimum altitude to fly at. But for us, it's 55,000 feet Mach 1.4. OK. Got another question from University of Alabama. It seems like maybe there might have been some extra credit <laughs> offered here or something. But Anthony in aerospace engineering asks, how long have the two of you been working on the X-59, and how many hours do you put into it roughly per week or total? Maybe just a good kind of question about the workload that's involved with a project like this and the roles that you're playing. Uh, I can say that Corey and I happen to both be on the project full time. So uh, as government employees, 40 hours a week. Um, but you know, there are times when you have to put in a little bit of extra effort and, and I'd say most of the researchers on our project, we just came out of critical design review. Uh, you know, there's some real long days for us. <laughs> but you know, the great thing about the work environment is it, it ebbs and flows. So. There's long days and there are days that are a little bit more relaxed and you can focus on some other research interests and, and whatnot. But yeah, we are, we're both on full time and that is kind of the norm, right. especially for such a large project like this. Yeah, I've, I started working, like I said, at Supersonics when I came back from my Washington DC detail, which was uh, 2012. So I've been on it, uh, what is that, seven years now. Mm -hmm. um, like Mary said, we're full time, but that's not true of everybody on the project. Some people work part time and, and dedicate another half of their time working uh, another project or other research that they're working on. 
So I'm going to ask a question that you just alluded to the the uh, CDR, uh, which is a big milestone in the, in the project. Can you? I don't know what you can talk to us about that, but what? Uh, how important is that in the sort of the evolution of this project? It's it. So CDR stands for Critical Design Review, and it's it's a pretty big milestone in terms of uh, the development of the project. Uh, it it's supposed to represent. Uh, I'm not sure what percent design completion, but mm -hmm. but it's pretty far along. Uh, and, and essentially, we we present to a, a review board uh, making our case for, for why we believe that we have a design that we can go proceed forward with and fly. Um, usually right after CDR, um, the manufacturing of the plane begins. In our case, we actually started a little bit early. We started making some of the pieces uh, of the actual airplane before we got to CDR. So when we were out there, we got to see uh, some of those first pieces uh, starting to show up on the floor out there. But yeah, it, it was it was a, a big deal, a big milestone for the project to to get that that final past that final hurdle, I guess, in terms of uh, program acceptance to move forward to flight. Excellent. So I've I got it. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, sometimes uh, when you're so involved in in the design, uh, you know, it it helps to pretty much collect everything that you've done and and put it in a you know, organized fashion and, and big reviews like this, you know, where you're so scope locked on the few things, you know, that you are working on for that particular airplane, you know, it's a good, it's a good way actually to kind of bring yeah. together all of the research that you, the individual teams have worked on. Um, so it, it's kind of effective for us as well, you know, on top of being reviewed by an external board, it's, you know, it's a good way for us to take a step and say, hey, are we, are we where we need to be? What are we worried about? We've got another question from uh, University of Michigan. Ming Ji in aerospace engineering asks, what's the function of the T-tail uh, despite a normal horizontal tail? So the, uh, the T-tail actually had two things that were beneficial. I mean, mo most of our stability is coming from that all-moving stab. That's our, that's our major control surface. The T-tail doesn't actually move um, with, uh, with the control stick input. It does, it does move, uh, change kind of a trim position uh, as we go supersonic. And so it does two things. One is it gives us a little bit more pitching moment, not much, but it gives us a little bit more to get us on that, uh, that optimized trim condition at, uh, at uh, our cruise condition. Uh, but I think more than that, it, uh, it helps us shape the sonic boom back there. Uh, that's that aft end is kind of a tricky area to to get that sonic boom under control, and that's just kind of another little trim tab that allows us to do that. Is really the the primary reason that that's there. Okay, so a question from the University of Hartford, Eva, who is an acoustical engineering and music major. Why do you use the PLDB scale as opposed to a DBA scale? Well, it's related to the short period of time over which you're you're assessing the loudness of it. Essentially, there are multiple scales, um, especially on ICAO. They they've looked at um, a couple different scales. We're not acoustics people, so I can't talk extensively about that. But I'm sure you can find papers on it. But um, yeah, it has to do with the fact that this is a you know a very a very short time period that the noise is occurring over. And it essentially takes that into effect um, with regards to how loud it is, the impact of that right. loudness. So. You know, I think one of the things we talked about earlier was the diversity of engineering uh, disciplines that are involved in a project like this, acoustics and, mm -hmm. and a variety of other uh, disciplines. I mean, can you talk a little bit about working across discipline and uh, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary uh, kind of project like this? Uh, yeah, we can both take it. Um, uh, it's. It's challenging but great all at the same time because it forces you to see how your your design and analysis impacts other areas. I think oftentimes in the university setting, although you know there's graduate projects where you interface a lot more, you're so focused on your one thing and and having to work with structures and you know aerodynamic people and and even propulsion to some extent like. We all impact each other, and you're you're forced to communicate or or perish essentially. So, um, it's challenging. We're we're multi-center. We're not just right. all in one location, and we're different specialties. So, right. uh, you know, there's added challenges there, but I think it makes us better for it. So, 
I've been told that the controls people are the worst. Though. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're, I, we're at I the bottom that, of the, to the totem yeah. pole, you know. Everyone makes their changes, and then they say, is it still stable? <laughs> I say that because Mary and I work in that yeah. arena. So, so, yeah, we work uh, simulation, controls, flight dynamics, and so we end up taking a lot of the models that are provided by these other disciplines, structures, um, like Mary said, uh, aero, all of it come together and feed into our simulations that, that model how the, the airplane is actually going to fly. So it, it kind of forces us to work with all of those groups. Um, and then beyond that, you had mentioned, I think somebody was a, an acoustics engineer, right. acoustics yeah, research. Acoustic, yeah. you know, we, we have those um, uh, propagation models. You know, we have aerodynamicists that do computational fluid dynamics that tell you, you know, where the shock waves are and what the pressure is right around the, the airplane itself. And then there are propagation models for how those shock waves, um, what, what they do, how they behave as they make their way to the ground, which is a, a separate discipline um, and, a, and a separate tool set that, that does that. Okay. So there's, there's a lot of different disciplines that go Let me see if we, I think we might have time for at least a couple more questions. Anthony, uh, aerospace engineering from uh, University of Alabama, asks, what is the airfoil shape of the aircraft is, is it standardized like uh, NACA airfoils, or is it more customized or a different standard? So I think that it starts off as a NACA airfoil, and then, uh, and then it gets shaped from there. Uh, definitely in this case, I think that's true for, for most aircraft, or it's a blend of a couple different NACA airfoils. Uh, in this one, uh, a little bit more went into it because of the low boom design and the shaping of it. You know, a big part of that low boom design is is tailoring uh, the pressure profile over over the entire airplane, but especially the wing as well. So, um, so yeah, there's a lot of fine tuning that that goes into it that kind of takes you away from the original Mac airfoil that you started with. Okay, from University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign, Gabriel, uh, also in aerospace engineering, asks: You mentioned that the shock wave dispersion is affected by atmospheric conditions. How exactly is it affected? I'm not sure I can say yeah, exactly right. how, um, but I know a lot of it, I, I believe a lot of it, as I understand it, is to the good. So uh, humidity, turbulence effects, you know, those things um, uh, I think, I think kind of help break up the shock wave, kind of help reflect it and, and, and make it dissipate as it goes to the ground. Um, temperature variations, you know, just, just anything like that. You know, it, it, I think it is kind of similar to, um, you know, light refracting as it, as it goes through different substances, water and stuff like that, and that kind of breaks, breaks up and, and shifts the, the shock waves around. All right. We got a question from Missouri uh, uh, Science and Technology. Uh, Kristen, majoring in aerospace engineering, asks, can either of you recall a moment where everything seemed to come together, your eureka moment, or would you characterize uh, this effort as more of an uphill battle the entire time? I would say at this point it's probably more an uphill battle. Um, well, I, I made you know the comment before where, especially as controls engineers, we're kind of at the bottom of the totem pole. So as, as everyone else is trying to figure out their optimization and, and getting everything right, you know, we see the impact and then it's like, oh, okay, all right, we gotta go back to the table. Is this, is this still okay? Is this still a stable aircraft? Do we need to tune the flight controls? So it's, it's just a continual process. There's no aha moment. Maybe for the, the people designing the outer mold line where they finally realized, okay, all right, we've kind of zoned in on it. Maybe they had an aha moment, but I think for us, it's, our goal is just make sure this is a stable aircraft and every time there's small changes, are we still there? Are we still where we need to be? So. I think the aero group might have had. I don't know if yeah, it's it called saying, a eureka aero. moment, but, yeah, but, but you know, fighting a challenge that they mm -hmm. that they saw come yeah. up and like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? But then when they got it solved, it was more of a oh, okay, yeah, right. mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Well, fantastic. I, I want to thank uh, all the students uh, from around the country who sent in their questions. Excellent questions. I'm afraid we we don't have time to cover them all, but uh, I think it really spurred some good conversation here. And thank you, Mary and Corey for your work, uh, your insight, and especially your advice to the students who, who joined us this evening and who will be able to watch this uh, webinar later when it's uh, posted. Before we sign off, I want to share some key resources and opportunities with our audience. Uh, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on the series website. Uh, 
be sure to visit the learn more section. Some of you asked some questions that we didn't have time to elaborate on, but you'll find technical papers recommended by our subject matter experts and information on a wide range of student and faculty opportunities through NASA as well as the Space Grant Program. So the Space Grant Program uh, uh, provides a link for you to connect, and if we could show that slide, uh, a link for you to connect to your space, uh, space grant in your state. As we talked about earlier, every state, the District of uh, Columbia and Puerto Rico have a space grant. You can learn more about scholarships, fellowships, internships, student flight and design programs, faculty research, curriculum projects, as well as pre-college enrichment programs for students and teachers. Space grants are a key link in NASA, uh, to NASA in each state. So explore these websites and connect with your space grant in your state. NASA also offers a number of internships. We've talked about some tonight. Paid internships are offered at the agency's 10 centers and through its NASA Internships and Fellowships program, as well as fellowships for graduate students. The program website offers more information on these programs and how to apply. The Aeronautics Research Mission Directorate also has a university leadership initiative. Uh, it's a special opportunity. It's different from other research grants in that it funds teams led by universities that get to propose research on what they want. After two rounds of awards in this program, NASA is engaged with 34 universities so far. And the key is that the universities in this case lead as, as long as the topic is related to NASA's work. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in this, please uh, look for the solicitations that are posted annually uh, via NSPIRES. I want to remind you that we have two more webinars coming up. On Thursday, October 24, we'll explore safe flight for drones, designing a system for urban mobility. And on Wednesday, November 6, we'll close out the series with a look at electrified aircraft tackling the challenges of alternative propulsion. Please join us next time when your host will be Suzanne Smith, Professor of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Kentucky and Director of the Kentucky Space Grant Consortium. Good night.